You're listening to the Just Japan podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to episode number 38 of the Just Japan podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. My name is Kevin O'Shea, and I am your host. I am a Canadian living and working in Japan. And each week I bring to you a different episode about some aspect of life in Japan. And I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to download the Just Japan podcast. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to subscribe on iTunes or listen on Stitcher or SoundCloud. Hey, I want to take,、uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to share this podcast with your friends.、Um, now, this is episode number 38. Wow, 38, isn't that amazing? We're getting closer and closer to number 40, the big 4 0. And I got to admit,、uh, it's again, I, I, I say it often and I'll say it again because it's true. I'm so impressed with. How many people are, are taking,、uh, you know, listening to the show?、Um, they're enjoying it,、uh, they're spreading the word, getting lots of great feedback, and I really appreciate that, guys.、Um, whenever you send me a message about the show that you're listening to it, that you enjoy it,、uh, that really does make me happy. It really does motivate me to continue making the podcast something that、uh, is very near and dear to my heart. Now it is episode number 38, and this week it's a little bit different than normal episodes. This week I won't be interviewing a guest. You just got Kevin solo this week, guys.、Uh, it happens from time to time. So this episode is going to be more of a mailbag episode. And what I did is I sent a question out on social media to you fine folks out there. If you have any questions about Japan you'd like me to try to tackle, To try to take on an answer, I will do my best. Now, of course, my, my knowledge is only limited, limited to certain areas、uh, and experiences here in Japan. So, again,、uh, I will try my best.、Uh, a few questions that were thrown my way, I really don't know the answers to or even where to begin, but、uh, you know, I'll try. So,、uh, yeah, so there we go.、Uh, episode number 38. I want to thank, first of all, all you guys for, for taking the time to subscribe on iTunes. That's the best way to listen to this show because you'll always be updated right away. Newest episodes will always be dropped right in your feed and you can download them onto your, your computer, your PC, your Mac, your iOS device.、Um, you know, if you're, if you're not a fan of iTunes, you can use Stitcher Internet Radio, great way to listen to a streaming anywhere you go. You can get the free Stitcher app. For your Android device, for your iOS device, or again, listen on your PC or Mac,、um, or listen to the last, the, the most recent episodes in SoundCloud.、Uh, you know, those are all great ways. And you can go to busankevin.com, busankevin.com, and that's the,、uh, the place that's the hub of the Just Japan podcast.、Uh, the show notes, you're like, what the heck is Busan Kevin? Well, that was、uh, my YouTube handle. I'm, I'm, I'm initially a YouTuber. Um, I've, I've been a blogger for years. I've been a blogger since the 90s.、Um, I started in YouTube in early or late 2006.、Uh, I've got a few channels on YouTube. A lot of people out there know me as Busan Kevin. Busan, what's that? Well, it's the second largest city in South Korea. That's where I lived. That's where I was working when I initially got into YouTube. And hey, so many years later, I'm still doing it. Maybe not as active as I once was, but I'm still there from time to time. Um, yeah, so go to boostlikehaven.com to check out all the podcast information. All right, folks, it is time for the mailbag section to begin. And basically, I'm just going to jump right into it. I got a lot of very interesting questions on social media、uh, for this episode of the Just Japan podcast. Questions you have about Japan. Some I can't answer, some I can't answer, some I have no idea even where to begin. But I'm going to try my best. And I'm going to go through a list of questions that were on both YouTube. I posted a video yesterday on my Jayland Kev channel、um, saying, hey, if you've got questions for this week's episode, leave them in the comment section below. I also posted something on the Just Japan podcast Facebook page. 
By the way, the link for the Facebook page is at BusanKevin.com. Go check that out. Um, hey, I'm there a lot. It's fun. There's like 2,500 of you awesome people now, and that is wicked. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go through some some questions. I'm going to begin right away. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question by Distal. Your thoughts, uh, so this is from YouTube, Distal. Your thoughts on Halloween and other based holidays in Japan? How are they celebrated in Japan? And how did they get introduced? And what are the main differences between the country of origin and Japan? Well, Distal, um, if you want to know about Halloween, I suggest listening to the last episode of the Just Japan podcast, the Halloween episode. The whole thing is all about Halloween in Japan and comparing it to other countries and all that stuff. So um, as far as Halloween goes, I'm not going to get back into that. Um, I put out the Halloween episode nice and early because I wanted a lot of people to have a chance to listen to it before Halloween actually happened. I do realize that uh, with the podcast, often there are people, uh, you know, even who are subscribed to it that don't get a chance to listen to it for a week or more after they download it. And I, I completely understand that with, you know, busy schedules and whatnot. Um, so, but I will talk about briefly about Christmas. Now, Christmas is a, it has in recent years become a very big thing in Japan. But if you are a North American, like I am, I'm a Canadian, or you're from a Western Christian culture where Christmas is a big thing, if you're from Scandinavia or Europe, uh, where Christmas is a major thing. In Japan, it's 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 celebrated, but it, it's a bit of an odd thing. I mean, I think less than 1% of Japanese people are Christian, so it's got obviously nothing to do with religion. Um, Japanese people like a good party. They like they like uh, any excuse to be able to give gifts to people, to have fun. Um, retailers, corporations, like, of course, uh, corporations, retailers, anywhere else in the world, like any excuse to make money. So they market it as a big thing. Now, uh, Christmas in Japan is more of a couple's holiday as opposed to a family holiday. So um, it starts really darn early because, again, it's, it's, not a, it's not a traditional holiday here. And it's actually not a holiday in Japan. I mean, you don't get time off for Christmas. Uh, you know, schools aren't closed unless for whatever reason because of the calendar year, the winter vacation falls at that point. But last year, I mean, I was teaching in Osaka uh, Osaka uh, public schools, and I booked Nankyu or days off for the whole winter holiday. But if I hadn't done that, I would have been actually teaching on Christmas Day because, again, it's not a holiday here. People aren't Christian, um, so it's an event. It's not a holiday. It's an event. Uh, Christmas is an event. So I, we're already starting to see it. It's, uh, I'm recording this episode. I've started recording probably over the span of two days. Uh, but on October 27th, and uh, so Halloween hasn't even happened yet, but the Halloween snacks are pretty much off the shelves already, and all the Christmas snacks are on the shelves in the supermarkets, and the Christmas displays are going up, and you say, hey, that's really early for Christmas. Well, when you're a country that really doesn't traditionally celebrate Christmas, I mean, you kind of do what you want to do, right? Or you don't know how to do it, I suppose, depending on your perspective. Um... But yeah, so you know, some people will get Christmas trees. Some some kids will have Christmas trees in their houses, small ones, some small artificial ones. Um, you'll start hearing Christmas music around, kind of a limited selection. Uh, you'll hear Mariah's Mariah Carey's "All I Want for Christmas" playing everywhere you go. There's a Wham Christmas song you'll hear everywhere. Um, you'll see Christmas displays and decorations around, lots of, uh, and it kind of does feel a bit like the festive spirit in a way. Um, Leading up to the day, uh, Japanese people don't eat turkey. Um, you're not going to get turkey in Japan unless you go to Costco. Some supermarkets will sell small turkeys that are about the size of a chicken that are, are going to cost you about 30 bucks. But, you know, Costco, that's where I'm going to get turkey this year. I'm going to be in Japan this year for Christmas. Now, I work at a, a place where I'm actually going to have that time off. Um, and uh, so people don't eat turkey, but they eat chicken. And a big place to get your 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 Christmas chicken is a KFC Kentucky Fried Chicken, that American fast food chain, which is so loved and embraced here in Japan. And they have special Christmas sets. And on Christmas Eve or a couple of days before Christmas, there will be long lines of people, long lineups outside of of KFC waiting to get their their Christmas bucket of chicken. Um, the Christmas festivities don't happen on Christmas Day. Again, it's not a family thing. It tends to be on Christmas Eve. And it's more of a couple's holiday here in Japan. So uh, lots of young couples uh, like to get, you know, like to have a good time like young couples do. 
And the thing is, here in Japan, um, most unmarried young people, when I say young people, I mean in their 20s, if you're a working person, you're unmarried, you probably live at home with your parents. So I'm a young guy. I live at home with my mom and dad. My girlfriend lives at home with her mom and dad. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to have, um, how shall I say, in a nice way. Uh, without having any kind of explicit rating like I did with the last episode. Um, you know, private affairs, we'll just say. Um, so what do you have to do? There's the love motels, which are kind of prevalent throughout Japan. You're going to have to rent a room in a motel, and you can rent you can rent by the hour. So um, that's what a lot of people do. Um, I've heard, and I've never seen with my own eyes, but I've heard rumors that in places like Shibuya and Shinjuku and downtown Tokyo, that on Christmas Eve there are actually lineups lineups of couples outside of love motels is it true i don't know could be but that's what i've heard um so it's, it is quite a bit different than if, if you are a north american if you're a westerner you're from australia you're from new zealand you're from scandinavia you're a swede you're a norwegian you know you're from europe it, it is very different christmas experience here and the one thing that's very interesting is that um even on christmas day they start pulling all the christmas decorations and displays start coming down from all the shops and department stores, and all the New Year's ones come up. Because New Year's, that's the true celebration in Japan. That's the, People actually have holidays, and that's the, Oshogatsu, that's the most important holiday of the year here in Japan. Definitely New Year's. So uh, there you go. Um, again, you want to know about Halloween, you go check out the Halloween episode, uh, episode number 37, and there's a little bit about Christmas here in Japan. <laughs> All right, so Jenna over on on uh, YouTube had a question. She said, I always wondered about TV programming in Japan. How many channels are there? Is there a way to get American programming, or is it expensive to get it? Another thing I always wondered about is the Wi-Fi over there. Is it good? Thanks, from Jenna. Well, Jenna, thank you for taking the time to leave the questions on my YouTube channel. Um, yeah, you definitely get American TV programming here in Japan, Jenna, but you're going to have to get cable. So you're going to get a basic, if you get a basic kind of cable set up, uh, it's going to cost you not so much. That's what I have. Um, but all my TV channels are Japanese. I don't get any uh, any American programming or foreign programming on my TV. Now, the thing is, though, my TV is essentially for my children. I've got a, I've got a four-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old, and the TV entertains them. I get all of my media consumption through my computers uh, online, and that tends to be after the kids go to bed. When they're awake, they have a monopoly on the TV. And if there were two TVs in the house, each one would have an, a monopoly. Um, you want to get American TV, you're going to have to get a cable package. You're going to pay 30 40 bucks a month for a cable package, basic cable package. You're going to get, it's, it's not the greatest, but you're going to get some, some American programming. You can get, you know, if you've got kids over here, you can get the Cartoon Network, um, the Disney Channel. Not all of it is in English. Some of it is. You're going to have a handy little button on your remote control on your TV sometimes, depending on the programming, to be able to push... And it can either it'll, it'll switch from Japanese to English. Um, at the end of the day, you want to you want to consume American media. Um, you're probably going to do it online. Um, you can get uh, Hulu, Hulu Japan, um, or the best thing to do is get get a proxy server set up, a VPN client, um, so your computer doesn't know where you are. Maybe if if you're in America before you come to Japan, set up a Hulu like a Hulu.com account and a Netflix account, and uh, Come over here to Japan and uh, run a VPN client on your computer and then enjoy all that stuff online. Um, Wi-Fi is it good over here? It's very good. Much better than Wi-Fi connection you're going to find in Canada or probably most places in the States. Uh, much faster, much faster download rates. It's, it's good. Um, yeah, so you'll be impressed. Uh, when I go back to Canada and visit my family in Canada, I'm just like, oh my God, it's so slow, the internet. So uh, there you go, Jenna. Thanks for leaving the questions. Okay, and another question on the YouTube uh, video comment section from Interschange. I think that's how you might say it. Your thoughts on working for one of the major Eikaiwas? Well, an Eikaiwa, guys, is an English language school. That's what it basically means. Um, there are major ones in Japan, such as Eon. Amity, Nova, um, what else do we have out there? ECC, 
Um, there are quite a few big big companies out there, and uh, GABA. Um, my thoughts, I'm glad I don't have to work for one, so there we go. <laughs> uh, I don't have experience working for an Eikaiwa chain in Japan, but I do have I do have quite a bit of experience from my years in Korea. And in Korea, they're called Hogwans, and that's basically it's an English language school. It's the same thing. And there's not a lot of difference between them. Um, so I can maybe speak uh, to that experience. And I, I worked for uh, a couple of major chains in uh, in, in Korea. Um, negatives, benefits, all this, um, between working for a large Eikaiwa chain and a, and a small one or maybe a family-run one or a mom-and-pop one. If it's a small one, a mom-and-pop organization, um, you're going to be treated pro you know, there's a possibility they might be treated much better because you're kind of their breadwinner. You're very important. You might get paid a bit more. Um, they're going to listen to you. You're going to obviously have direct communication with the people on top because they're probably right there beside you. But at the same time, the pockets might be a bit shallow. And if they're running into hard economic times, maybe they won't have the money to necessarily pay you. And that happened to me at one point back in 2003. Um, my first year, I worked for a major kind of franchise chain called Wonderland in Korea. My second year, I worked for a, a small little hogwan called Day by Day English School. Now, I'll mention that because they're long gone. Um... And it was like literally, it was it wasn't even a franchise. It was just a, a one-off thing run by this husband and wife. Um, very very sweet man, uh, Korean man. Uh, his 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 English name was Joe Joe Kim, and he liked he called himself Joe because he loved Joe Montana, the San Francisco 49ers, is what he always told me. Um, really nice guy, but not the greatest businessman. Um, spent a lot of the day doing internet gambling in his office just on his computer doing internet gambling. So, um, you know, there you go. Um, it seemed like a good place for the first six months, and then he started having to reduce my pay each month um, because he didn't have money in the coffers to give me. He had to reduce the pay of the bus drivers for the school, then eventually let a bus driver go, and then he had to drive the bus, and it just went on and on and on. And I, I, I sucked up, and I sat out my... I was able to get through my contract... And he asked me to resign for another year, and I said, I can't do this. I made up a lie that I wanted to move to downtown Seoul and work for a big adult school. Um, in reality, it was because I knew that um, they were going bankrupt soon. And they did, just a few months after that. Um, but I was treated very well, and it was a very kind of warm family environment. Um, if he had been a smarter businessman, it would have been a much a really good place to work. Uh, then I went on to work for a major Eikaiwa chain or Hagwan chain. And in and, and a case like that, you're just another cog in the wheel. And there's the thing, working for a major Eikaiwa, you're a cog in the wheel. You're just a number. You're no one. You, you don't count. You've got no voice. You get a pay, probably not the best pay, and that's it. That's what you got. Um, uh, yeah, it's. I think the major Eikaiwa chains... Once upon a time, maybe they were good, and I've heard that, for example, like a company like ECC, there are some people who've been there for a very long, long time, and they were kind of grandfathered in on much higher salaries. So they started 10, 15, 20 years ago, and they were maybe making well over Sanju Man in a month, um, Sanju, Go Ma, Sanju Go Man in a month, like uh, good, good, good cash. Um, and they kind of, like I said, got grandfathered into that. Now you make substantially less doing the same kind of work. Um, maybe even having more responsibility for a lot less pay. Um, so, you know, the major Eikaiwa chains, um, mm, yeah, I mean, from what I gather, even if you're, like, really dedicated to the job, um, there's not a lot of reward for that financially. Um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, again, I don't know. I, in, in some ways, I have never worked in Japan for an Eikaiwa chain, but again, I worked in Korea for, for several, and I'm assuming, from what I gather, pretty similar stuff. So, interest change. Uh, it's hard for me to, to pronounce your handle. Hope that helps. Okay, and now it's time to tackle some questions from YouTube viewer Living Tree Home School and Crafts. And she's got quite a few questions. I'll try to take on a few, okay? <laughs> Here we go. 
Um, she asked, what was your overall impression when you first arrived in Japan? Was it a positive, negative, or unknown, not sure one? Well, mine it was quite positive. Um, I had been living in Asia for five plus years. I had traveled to Japan many times um, during visa runs. I had met my wife in Japan or in Korea, and I came to Japan and spent some time here with her before I moved on to Canada and then eventually. Came well, oops, guys, a little problem with the recording here. A lot of issues with the sound quality. For some reason, I can't figure it out. And the computer crashing. So my answer got cut off partway through, and then I jump in, kind of choppy choppy, but let's keep going. Yeah, so I've been living in Korea um, for quite some time, and I guess maybe still kind of a developing country. Modern in some aspects, but in others not. Um, maybe not always the cleanest place, maybe not always the best smelling place. And um, sometimes there were cultural aspects of Korea that rubbed me the wrong way. But, you know, Japan always seemed to rub me the right way, and I really enjoyed my, my travels here. And uh, the time I spent, it was, it was always really wonderful. So to be honest, when I first came to Japan, I had very, very positive, positive um, vibes about it. I really enjoyed it. I was very excited to come here, and I really liked it. There were some things that frustrated me, obviously the language barriers and cultural things that I had to learn, but for the most part, it was very positive. Now, um, she also asked, what is my impression of it now? Well, you know what? I've been here for six years, six years and change, and honestly, uh, in many respects, I'm very, mm, how shall I say, interested in pursuing a new career, probably back in Canada. Uh, just a career that could earn me more money, uh, be more financially viable for my family and I, you know, I've got kids now and I've got, you know, I'm, I'm not as young as I once was. I'm 39 now, guys. Uh, let the cat out of the bag for those of you who didn't know. So, you know, I'm thinking about the future. Um, part of the reason why I'm studying my master's, you know, I'm looking for employment that generates more income. And there definitely are more opportunities for someone who has a background in IT and education in, in a country like Canada than here. For example, someone who doesn't speak Japanese. Like, I don't speak Japanese. Just kind of survival Japanese, not the kind I could work at, you know, use, use in a professional setting. So I still really like Japan. I think it's a great country. It's really awesome. I'm always going to have a connection with Japan. I'm always going to have a foot in the door here because my wife is Japanese and my kids are were born here. They're half Japanese. But uh, eventually I think we're probably going to move on to Canada, but we're probably going to spend a lot of time coming back here over the, the course of our lifetimes, essentially. Yeah, so uh, there you go, my impression of it now. Um, now, Living Tree Home School and Crafts also asked, where are some places you would not go in Japan and why? Haunted areas, areas that have a bad rap, dangerous, etc. Um, you know what? Japan is a really safe country compared to Canada or America or the UK or Australia. Um, the kind of crime rate is much lower. I mean, there is definitely crime here. I mean, there's some of the biggest gang syndicate, the, the largest gang syndicate, um, organized crime syndicate in Japan is just not that far away from me, the Yamaguchi Gumi, the Yakuza syndicate. But, um, you know, they're, they're, they're mixed up in very nefar nefarious stuff. They're the underworld, they're the mafia, the Cosa Nostra of Japan. But um, unless you're mixed up in bad stuff too, really that doesn't affect you in any way. Right, so if you're just a guy who's like a school teacher and you go to work in the day and then come home to your family every single night and you don't go to clubs and stuff like that, and oh, you know, people like that have no interest in you. <laughs> um, so I mean, there are some kind of shady areas, I suppose. A year, many years ago, I stayed in an area and I can't remember the name of it. It wasn't too far from Tenoji, and Tenoji in Osaka has been quite gentrified in recent years. Actually, it's not. Even it's not as seedy as it was when I remember coming here and going visiting in like 2006 or 2007. Um, but there was an area close to Tenoji. I remember I stayed in for a few nights where they had traditionally a lot of the kind of um, homeless people, transient workers, daytime workers, you know, those kind of people. And... Um, I wouldn't say it's shady by like Canadian standards or American standards, but it's pretty shady. Um, did I feel danger? No. Would I want to hang out there with my children? No. 
Um, and I'm, I'm certain there's there's definitely a lot of shady areas, like nighttime areas, different like red light districts and stuff around uh, at night. There's a lot of which are probably pretty sketchy and pretty dangerous to be in. But I've never been to any of those areas because I'm a happily married man with kids, <laughs> so I don't go to red light districts. Um, yeah, so there are definitely areas in Japan that are shady, um, but the crime rate is much lower than, say, for example, in Western culture, uh, Western cultures, Western countries. Um, also, too, the kind of a cultural thing, the people aren't as aggressive. Um, and there's also not such a, cult, a drug culture. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of people, for example, in Canada and the kind of poor areas who have a lot of addiction issues, um, mental health issues, addiction issues combined. A lot of them are panhandlers, and they tend to be aggressive panhandlers, and that often has to do with them needing to feed some kind of addiction. Whereas and that isn't so much of an issue here. So you don't get those aggressive panhandlers. Um, yeah, so there you go. Mm. Now, uh, Living Tree Home also asked me, um, are there any haunted areas or forests? Are you willing to do a video on that area and shoot some eerie footage? Uh, I, I would love to. Maybe do a Halloween Haunted Japan edition. I did a Halloween Haunted Japan edition podcast. It was last week's episode, episode number 37. When I think of a haunted forest in Japan, the only thing I think of would be the, uh, and there was a great Vice documentary about it on YouTube. Type in like Vice um, Suicide Forest. The Suicide Forest in um, by Mount Fuji in Shizuoka. That's creepy. That's a creepy freaking documentary. It's about this man who volunteers to try to talk suicide people out of committing suicide. And for some strange reason, there's something about the forest outside of close to Mount Fuji where so many people travel from all around Japan to come to this forest, to go into this forest and kill themselves. And it's, wow, it's freaky. I would I would definitely go there with my camera and, and shoot kind of a mini documentary. But, I mean, that's really, really far away. <laughs> that's something that would take me days to do. I'd have to take the train up there and, and do this in. Man, that, that's freaky. Freaky documentary. Go to uh, go onto YouTube and type in Vice Suicide Forest. And uh, that's that's a place that's definitely going to have a lot of ghosts. Definitely a lot of ghosts. A lot of unhappy spirits there. Um, around here, I don't know. I, don't, I just simply don't know uh, what kind of places. But that's probably the most infamous in Japan for being a creepy place. Yeah. Now, um, last question for Living Tree Home, School and Crafts. Um, she asked me, if a person actually has a major in English, you have a bachelor's degree with an actual major in English, not a major in underwater basket weaving or accounting or something like that, do the Japanese consider that more superior, better in terms of teaching than in general bachelor's degrees? Would they get paid more? Um, no and no. Um, for the Japanese people, if you're a native English speaker and you have a bachelor's degree in pretty much anything, it's pretty much considered equal across the board. That's all you need to get your working visa, your teaching visa. Uh, are you going to get paid more? No. Um, the only way you're going to get paid more, and you will be considered like superior better if you have a teaching credential. Um, so if you actually have a teaching credential in America or Canada or Australia or England, so you can actually teach like in an elementary school or a kindergarten in your home country, if you can do that, you get that credential, um, then you, you will be considered quote-unquote, superior or better. Um, will you receive more money? Yeah, you can. Um, depending on the situation, a lot more, and other situations, um, a bit more. So, uh, you know, if you have a teaching degree, if you actually have a degree in English, maybe you are familiar with more literature and this or that, maybe you've got a bit of a better grasp on grammar because of a writing background, but you really, you're pretty much on the same page as anyone who has a degree in, like, uh, you know, sociology or geography or metallurgy, um, basically. Uh, so if you got the teaching certification, and I, when I say a teaching certification, I don't mean like a TESOL certificate or, or maybe even a CELTA. I mean like an actual like teaching degree. Uh, so you could teach in an elementary school, junior high school, a high school in your own country. Um, yeah, so that'll, that'll help you a lot. Uh, so there you go. Living Tree and Home. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. 
Um, you asked me one about three distinctive special things about Japanese culture, but uh, my brain isn't working right now. That's a bit hard to think of. <laughs> All right, awesome sauce. Okay, let's move on to the next questions. Next set of questions. Okay, AMMX on YouTube asks, I'm a programmer and I want to work in Japan. So I'm a programmer, I want to work in Japan. Do I need to learn Japanese? Yes. It's that simple, <laughs> really. Um, you're a programmer and you want to work in Japan. You're a graphic artist, you want to work in Japan. I've gotten this question over the years many times. I've heard other YouTubers who know a lot more about Japan, um, guys who are like, you know, uh, Victor in Nagoya, give me a break, man, um, Hiko Simon up in uh, Tokyo. He was on the episode about getting permanent residency. Th those guys have been here for more than 20 years, and, and they speak Japanese fluently. If you want to work outside of the English language industry, the English teaching industry, chances are nine times out of ten, you got to speak Japanese, not just a little bit. Like you got to be able to communicate and work in the language. Um, there's tons of programmers here in Japan, and they are Japanese, therefore they speak Japanese. So you're going to have to be able to work and communicate with them. Normally, like you know, Japanese companies will hire, f will bring in foreign people when there's a vacuum, there's a need, right? They they can't fill that position here in Japan, so they have to bring someone from outside of Japan. Um, so if you are a graphic artist, you're a programmer, you want to, especially when you want to work in the game industry, you got to know how to speak Japanese. Okay, uh, normally nine times out of ten, I'm going to think. No, maybe maybe there are exceptions to the rule. I'm assuming there maybe are some kind of some foreign foreign run game companies or software dev companies here in Japan. Um, I've never I've never tried to pursue. IT work here in Japan. I, I do have a background in IT. I used to work as a 3D artist in Canada back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and I'm about to start my my master's in education in IT. But I've never tried to look for an IT job um, in Japan. I've always worked as a teacher because I am a, I am a trained teacher in Canada. I'm a elementary, a kindergarten, elementary school teacher in Canada. So that's that's what I do here for now. Um, but yeah, so uh, again, I've heard other people who know more about this than I do, and they, they tend to say that you want to work in programming, you want to work in the kind of graphics software dev industry, you do got to speak Japanese. Um, and even more difficult, you're probably going to have to be able to read and write Japanese. Yeah, so time to get studying, AMMX. <laughs> Good luck. Okay, now we get a question from Scott on YouTube, and Scott says, he asked me, how common are shops that specialize in Western foods, and are they expensive? I'm from England. It would be good to know uh, that if I were to visit, that I could find British or even some American Canadian foods too. Um, absolutely, Scott. There are definitely a lot of shops that specialize in imported food. They're all over the place in the bigger cities. Now, in the rural areas, you're probably going to be pretty much out of luck. But in a, a city like Kobe, where I live, and in, in other areas of Japan, there's a, a major chain of, of uh, import food shops called Kaldi, Kaldi Coffee, or Kaldi Coffee Farm. And they carry loads of stuff from all over the world. Um, in Kobe itself, there's probably also like several, uh, there are several independent um, import food shops. Here we've got I've got two Costco's uh, close by. They carry tons of foreign food, and then of course there's FBC, the Foreign Buyers Club. Um, do a Google search for Foreign Buyers Club Kobe, and you'll see it's a mail order uh, foreign import food place. Uh, basically, that was how foreigners got imported food before there were Costco's here, before there were so many such a proliferation of foreign uh, food shops. So at a place like Caldi, I mean. You can get everything from Western Halloween candy, North American Halloween candy, to you know Thai food, Korean food. Uh, you're gonna find stuff from England, from the UK. You're gonna find uh, lots of stuff from America and Canada, uh, all over the place, basically. So there's definitely an abundance of that. So don't worry. Um, is it expensive? Absolutely, it's expensive. It's definitely expensive because it is an import delight, a delicacy. Um, so you're gonna pay money. Um, you're gonna tend to find that. Getting stuff at a shop like this is, you know, it's probably more than often going to be a treat for you. Um, it's just going to be something you get every once in a while, a specialty thing to make you feel better, maybe some comfort food from home if you're feeling homesick, that kind of thing. But 
Uh, Scott, have no fear. These shops are all over the place if you live in a larger urban area. If you live in Tokyo, Nagoya, or Osaka, Kobe, uh, Fukuoka, places like that, once you get into smaller areas, it's going to be harder and harder to find uh, import food because obviously the local people, there's probably not so many foreigners, if, if no foreigners at all. And, you know, if it's a rural area, the, the population, the demographic is probably an older one, and they really don't care so much for import stuff. They're pretty content with, you know, the domestic fare, so to speak. So there you go, Scott. Hope that helps. Please hang up and try again. Now, I got a question from Jack on YouTube, and he asked me, Kevin, what are my chances, or what are the chances of an older person getting a job teaching English in Japan? I'm male, healthy, in my mid-50s and semi-retired. I'd like to spend two or three years in Japan working and traveling. I have a degree, a BBA, in accounting, and, a, and an MBA. No teaching experience, but 30-plus years of work experience. I've taken some Japanese language courses and can carry on a very simple and short conversation if a Japanese person speaks clearly and slowly. I can read Japanese better than I can speak. Well, um, Jack, um, you know, you, you can find a job uh, at your age here in Japan. It, it is possible, but you are going to find it more of a challenge to find a job in Japan. Um, to be honest, and... You know, this is just this is just a thing. It's a cultural thing, and this wouldn't be okay in America or Canada, but it's just the way it is here uh, in Japan and also in a country like Korea. Um, there is definitely age discrimination. That is very apparent. It's very obvious. It, it does happen. And one of the first things, um, they do judge books by their covers. Um, and when you send, when you when you apply for a job, you send a resume. You're going to have to include a photo of what you look like and. You, the, your appearance in that photo can sometimes deter uh, you getting a job. Or, you know, basically, um, they can either um, help your chances or not help your chances. And, um, like I said, it's it, unfortunately ageism is is something that is is definitely alive and well in Japan, as well as sexism and and in, to an extent um, racism. Um, you know, I'm not going to really go there, but your appearance. At the end of the day, um, language schools in Japan, language schools in Korea, they often want to have young, white-looking foreigners, young, white-looking native English speakers, ideally. Um, if you're blonde, you're blue-eyed, and you're in your 20s, you've got a great chance of getting a job, even if you have no work or life experience. The, old, the older you get, the more challenging it can be, even if you do have experience. I'm not trying to deter you from trying. Try. Apply to a bunch of places. I'm sure you will get something. You will be able to find a, a work. Um, but it can be more challenging. When I first went to Asia to work, I was uh, 26 years old. Um, I was rather svelte. I was thin, uh, pretty good shape, uh, a thick head of black hair, very um, young looking, and yeah, I wasn't too bad looking either. Uh, now, fast forward, and I'm still under 40, but I've had premature graying, so um, my hair is basically, for the most part, white, and I started losing my hair many years ago. So at this point, although I'm under 40, uh, let's just say I'm I'm balding and I have white hair. Um, some might say I look a little bit older than my age. Um, and having a couple of young kids scampering around the house also adds to that. Um, but yeah, so I would actually probably, even myself, might have a tougher time finding a job than I would, um, say, 15 years ago, even though now I have a lot of teaching experience. I have my teaching certification. I'm an actual licensed elementary school teacher in Canada. Um... So on paper, man, you'd definitely want me to be teaching in your school than the me 15 years ago. But if you're just a judge by the picture, if you looked at the picture, well, uh, there are certain employers who might not give a crap about that, and they would hire the me of 15 years ago. So, uh, Jack, again, I'll repeat, um, yeah, being older will make it more challenging. There is no doubt about that. There are certain programs, like, for example, the JET program, the Japan Exchange Teaching Program, which um, 
we talked about in an earlier episode with uh, Mr. Jason Harris. He was a guest. Um, I think the cutoff for that is 40. Once you're 40, you can't apply for that. But there, there's a lot of other options. Lot, lots of private schools out there, language schools, international schools. Give it a try. You know, that's all I can say. Give it a try. Um, and just pepper your resume out there all over the place. I'll tell you, the hiring season in Japan, for the most part, is near the end of the year. So most schools, the school year in Japan begins in April, the beginning of April. And most schools start putting out advertisements for jobs in November, late November, December, January. And so you're going to see, you're going to go to the, the Japanese job websites like gaijinpot.com and some other ones. And uh, even this time of year, there's not many jobs advertised. But you'll start to see come November, the end of November, December, lots and lots of, of, of jobs advertised. So just also let it be known there that the hiring season in Japan comes near the end of the year. Just apply all over the place. Even apply to job. Even apply to companies that aren't advertising for people that say they're not looking. Apply anyway. Give it a whirl. Pepper yourself all over the place. And apply all over Japan. Don't limit yourself to one place. Too many people say, I want to live in Tokyo. Or, I want to live in this place. Um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to find work sometimes in, in Japan because it's so competitive. So many people want to come here. So just apply all over the place. And there you go, Jack. I hope that helps. Now, Francis left me a comment or a question. He said, hey, I sent you a Halloween card. Did you get it? I absolutely did. Second year in a row, Francis, you sent a wonderful, amazing Halloween card. And I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's hanging up on the wall. The kids love looking at it. Um, my daughter, Rena, who's one and a half, loves to point at it and, and make strange baby noises uh, in excitement and glee. So thank you so much, Francis. I definitely appreciate it, and I got it. Um, I left a, a direct message to you in Facebook, but I guess you didn't get it for whatever reason. But there you go. So thanks so much. Yay! Well, everyone, I want to thank you for taking the time to download and listen to episode number 38 of the Just Japan podcast, everything you want to know about Japan. Now, um, it's the support of wonderful people like you that keeps the show going, keeps me motivated. Uh, we got some good episodes lined up coming up soon, uh, some great interviews of some great people about different topics of interest in Japan. Um, so you remember, of course, you can subscribe to the Just Japan podcast in iTunes. I recommend that. That's definitely the best way to find out when the new episodes will come out because it'll just drop into your feed. You plug in your iPhone or your Android device or whatever it may be to your computer, and boom, they'll be coming down the pipeline. Uh, you can also listen in Stitcher Internet Radio, Stitcher.com, if you don't like the old iTunes. So you can get the free app for your Android device or your iOS device or listen to us online. Of course, you can listen in the Libsyn online player, soundcloud.com. All those links will be at busankevin.com. Busankevin.com is definitely the hub of the Boots on Kevin world, of the Just Japan podcast world. Uh, you can, of course, find me on Twitter, the Just Japan podcast, at jlandkev, J-L-A-N-D-K-E-V, jlandkev. That link will be uh, in the show notes at busankevin.com. Of course, you can... Hey, like the Facebook page, guys. The Facebook page for the Just Japan podcast is a happening place. Great community. 2,500 strong awesomeness. Uh, more than 2,500 people now. Uh, love it. I spend so much time. I've got the app on my iPhone. As I commute to work in the morning, I'm walking to work, walking to the train station during my breaks, lunchtime. I'm always checking out the Just Japan podcast the Facebook page and replying to people, posting stuff up there, posting links about weird news stories in Japan, um, posting videos there, posting just my thoughts, my observations, and I definitely post a lot of photos of Japan, so check that out, go like the Facebook page, the link is in the show notes at BusanKevin.com, great time had by all, and of course you can find me on uh, the YouTubes at YouTube.com slash BusanKevin or YouTube.com slash JalenKev, uh, again those links will also be in the show notes at BusanKevin.com. So, guys, a lot of great stuff coming coming in the future here on the, the Just Japan Podcast. I want to thank you guys so much for, for liking the show, for downloading the show, subscribing to the show. Um, remember, a call to arms, everybody. 
If you like this show, help make it grow bigger. Spread the word. Post the links to this uh, podcast on your social media sites, on your Twitter, on your Google+, on your Facebook, on your Tumblr, on your Instagram, on your friggin' Snapchat, whatever the heck it may be. Uh, share the show, and there you go. All right, guys, my name is Kevin O'Shea. I am a Canadian living and working in Japan, and I am the host of the Just Japan podcast, and you've just finished listening to episode number 38. Thanks for taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it, guys. You're awesome. And stay tuned. I'll be back next week for more things about Japan. Japan.